Jan Fumingo, and I'm delighted to participate in the 2020 Online International Conference on Men's Issues, and the title of my paper is Stop Anti-Male Indoctrination of Boys. Before I go on, I just want to apologize for the crudity of the technical side of the presentation. I've never recorded myself on my own computer before, and so I'm basically just going to read my paper out and make a few comments as well. Now, as most of you know, uh, my interest in men's issues has focused mainly on feminist ideology in Western universities. I've been looking at how anti-male doctrines have spread into every area of study, from anthropology to engineering, from health sciences to art history, and perhaps most worrisomely, uh, from law to social work to education. And my focus today is going to be on the manner in which this kind of anti-male indoctrination endemic to higher education is now um, being targeted at boys of younger and younger ages. And with respect to the title about stopping it, I have to admit that I don't know exactly how we can even begin to stop such indoctrination because it's now actually taking place within the family itself. And that's going to be really the focus of this presentation. But first, I'm going to uh, look at the, the background uh, to the problem and, and the extent of it, starting with the, the academy. So here goes. Contrary to what is sometimes thought, second wave feminism was never about equality, though of course there were women in the movement then and now who believed that it was. But the movement in its conceptual parameters was man-hating and female supremacist from the beginning. And we know that because it elevated the, the, the most hate-filled voices, the most aggressive, the most doctrinaire, the most radical. It's celebrated as a pioneering text. For example, Valerie Solanus's 1967 Scum Manifesto, which was a kind of feminist mind comp, which argued from the first page that, quote, to be male is to be deficient. And a little further on in the book, argued that, quote, just as humans have a prior right to existence over dogs by virtue of being more highly evolved and having a superior consciousness, so women have a prior right to existence over men. The elimination of any male is therefore a righteous and good act, end quote. Imagine that. In the year following the writing of this manifesto, Solanus actually attempted to kill artist Andy Warhol by shooting him three times with a 32 caliber automatic handgun. She also shot art critic Mario Amaya and attempted to shoot Warhol's manager, Fred Hughes. Her call for the murder of men and her actual murder attempts, for which she served two years in the New York State Prison for Women, garnered her legions of feminist admirers then and now, many more than willing to excuse and even to celebrate her actions as well as her words. Now, of course, not all feminists promoted the dehumanization and indeed the extermination of men, but they were pretty happy to be part of a movement that had Solanus and Robin Morgan and Susan Brown Miller and Andrea Dworkin and Catherine McKinnon and dozens of other anti-male ideologues as their spokeswomen. Now, the academic foundations of feminism were just as hateful, and this is made clear in an essay by feminist Paula Rothenberg. The title of the essay is Women's Studies, the Early Years, in a book called The Evolution of American Women's Studies. Well worth looking into. Paula Rothenberg was a leader in the second wave feminist movement and a philosophy professor for many years at William Patterson State College in northern New Jersey. In her essay, she includes the course outline for the first women's studies course she taught, which was in the philosophy department at Patterson State sometime in the mid-1970s. And she lists the assigned texts to give us a sense of what she calls, quote, the wild excitement so many of us felt, end quote, and the, quote, extent of the involvement of students and faculty who saw this enterprise as an extraordinary opportunity 
to be part of a historic new beginning, end quote. Now, anyone who thinks that women's studies started out with the moderate aim of introducing women's history and experiences into a primarily male educational environment will be quickly disabused of that notion by a glance at the crudely reductionist and indeed hateful theories that were part of the core curriculum. The reading list for Rothenberg's course included Susan Leiden's 1970 essay titled The Politics of Orgasm, which stated in its accusatory thesis on the very first page that women's sexuality was, quote, defined by men to benefit men, and quote, has been downgraded and perverted, repressed and channeled, denied and abused, end quote. In other words, women's sexuality was controlled by men to convince women of their sexual inferiority. The course also included Susan Griffin's 1971 article, Rape, the All-American Crime, which alleged that rape was the most frequently committed violent crime in America, and that it was actually an act of mass terrorism that was condoned by the culture or even taught and encouraged by the culture in order that powerful men could subjugate women. The syllabus also included Lucy Commissar's 1970 article entitled Violence and the Masculine Mystique, which alleged that, quote, the ultimate proof of manhood is sexual violence, end quote, and that, quote, the domination of women by men has been the prototype of the control men have tried to exercise over other men in slavery, in war, and in the marketplace, end quote. All the elements of anarchic hysteria, which would be further developed in the 1980s and 90s to become intersectional feminist theory, which many of us know something about, all the elements were already there, openly taught at universities with, as Rothenberg herself states, the enthusiastic approval of many professors who, far from raising the alarm about the unscholarly nature of such so-called knowledge, actually welcomed women's studies into academia with open arms. The most despicable false generalizations about so-called patriarchal power were thus given legitimacy. From this point, these despicable notions were allowed to infiltrate and ultimately to corrupt every academic endeavor as the number of female students rose to equal the number of male students, and then quickly to surpass the number of male students, anti-male initiatives continued to be implemented, always with the mantra that academia was an unwelcoming environment for women and that more needed to be done to make female students feel safe. And this meant initiatives such as raising the number of female students in the few disciplines such as engineering in which women didn't already outnumber men. It meant consent workshops and fear-mongering discussions of rape culture. It meant far-reaching and punitive sexual harassment policies that could punish a man for the most innocent of transgressions. It meant the prohibi prohibition of what are insultingly called manals, all-male panels at conferences. It meant decades of affirmative action hiring and even female-only professorships, not to mention female-only scholarships, and it meant toxic masculinity courses and policies in which female students are to speak first in the classroom and on and on. A few years ago, a classic self-hating letter by a male engineering student showcased the effect of such anti-male indoctrination in academia. Now, the letter was first published in the student newspaper at Eastern Washington University in Washington State and then approvingly circulated on feminist blogs and Facebook pages. It was written by a young man who abjectly confessed his male privilege, telling us that he had had a far easier time than his female peers 
in pursuing his engineering degree. Allegedly, he had never suffered what supposedly were the typical female traumas of being discouraged from doing science or being ignored by their teachers or being told they were bossy and so on. In a typical act of feminist self-contradiction, this young man claimed that if he achieved success in engineering, quote, the assumption of others will be that I earned it. This even while writing a letter, the whole point of which was that as a young man, he had supposedly never earned anything. He ended the letter by congratulating his female peers for their superior moral courage, telling them, quote, you have already conquered far more to be in this field than I have ever faced, end quote. This man had fully accepted his feminist compliant role. And alas, unlike in Las Vegas, what happens in the academy never stays in the academy. The anti-male animus has spread out with every succeeding wave of graduates into the wider society until there's no institution untouched by its corrosive hand. The anti-male animus is there in the primary and secondary school classroom where boys are now overwhelmingly taught by feminist teachers who believe that girls are the ones who require encouragement and who have traditionally been held back and that boys, especially white boys, should bear the blame. According to a 2012 multi-country report by the OECD, Teachers consistently award boys lower grades and communicate the message to male students that most of them are not gifted enough to pursue higher education. Such pedagogical bigotry has been practiced for decades, as Christina Hoff Summers, for example, has made abundantly clear with her research into the many aspects of schooling that now clearly favor girls and disadvantage boys. Anti-male assumptions aren't confined to school by any means. They're there in social work organizations and so-called helping agencies, such as, for example, Children of the Street, which was originally formed to prevent and intervene in the sexual exploitation of at-risk youth, but is now offering workshops in redefining manhood for 15 and 16-year-old boys to help young men become allies in the fight to end violence against women and girls. A poster campaign by this organization called Toxic Stops Here shows close-up pictures of teenaged boys inviting us to, quote, know the signs of toxic masculinity by confronting, quote, male privilege, social norms that support sexism, and oppressive behaviors, end quote. And this from an organization that works with at-risk youth, many of them boys who have been abused by their mothers or sexually abused with their mother's complicity. And this organization is now telling these boys that they are the problem. The anti-male messaging is also there in government-funded organizations such as Next Gen Men, which is a Toronto-based group that offers after-school programs for boys in grades 7 and 8, if you can imagine, to learn about what they call positive masculinity, which means feminist-compliant masculinity. Next Gen Men has a glitzy website that declares as its founding principle that men can be better. There's an asterisk informing us that this doesn't mean that men are inherently bad, though it's hard to imagine a program for 11 and 12 year old girls saying that its bedrock principle is that females can be better by learning to make their own needs and desires secondary. In its mission statement, Next Gen Men informs us, perhaps unnecessarily, that they, quote, believe in the equity of all genders as informed by feminism, end quote. So this is the kind of message 
that boys are receiving, whether in the counselor's office or in mainstream newspaper and magazine articles and statements by politicians and Hollywood actors, that unless they are willing to put women and girls first, they're not good people. And unfortunately, some feminist mothers are saying the same thing. In 2016, an essay was published in the On Parenting section of the Washington Post in which feminist Jody Allard, feminist journalist and managing editor of Parent Map, which is a Seattle-based parenting magazine, contemplated the failure of her teenaged boys to be feminist allies because they, quote, refuse to acknowledge their own culpability in sexism. This is, of course, the perfect feminist Kafka trap. If the boy refuses to admit that he's to blame for sexism, then he's to blame for refusing to admit that he's to blame. In the article, revealingly titled, quote, My Teen Boys Are Blind to Rape Culture, Jody Allard's anger at her son's refusal to accept her ideology is palpable in every sentence. Quote, they aren't willing to sacrifice their own comfort for my sake or for anyone else, she tells us. But one could more convincingly argue that it's she who isn't willing to sacrifice her comfort for the sake of her boys. Why does she insist that her children must believe what she believes and see what she sees, even if they can't see it? She explains that, quote, in this broken system, anyone who isn't with us is against us, particularly and especially men, even my own sons, even yours, end quote. This is a horrifying article in which the woman's sons honest expressions of skepticism about rape culture make them indistinguishable in their mother's mind from the ghoulish internet misogynists she despises. Quote, not all men, they remind me, and my guts wrench as my own sons mimic the vitriol of a thousand online trolls, end quote. It's frightening how she redefines a simple factual statement by one of her sons as vitriol, that the sons might be expressing a natural and healthy resistance to self-hatred seems never to occur to her. It's truly difficult to fathom the psychological discomfort of being one of those sons growing up in that atmosphere of blame, growing into adulthood alongside that impossible to appease mother's anger. It may be no coincidence that just six months earlier, this same feminist woman had written about the suicidal depression of one of her sons. And unfortunately, Joey, Jody Allard is not an outlier by any means. Some mothers begin their feminist proselytizing even earlier, an article by feminist mother Lane Brown from the Christian Science Monitor titled NYC Candid Catcall Video, How Can We Make Our Sons Stop? tells in toe-curling detail how a mother who watched a video about catcalling decided that she would need to start lecturing her son, who was not yet two years old, about the objectification of women so that when he attends preschool, as she tells us, he won't go there with the thought, quote, that girls are there to be looked at, end quote. Addressing him directly in her imagination, the mother tells her little boy that this is what her dream is, quote, my hope of hope before you even are able to form a sentence is that you will never form a sentence that makes someone feel ashamed or embarrassed, end quote. She realizes, she tells us that she's going to have to repeat her injunctions over and over again. And one can only imagine the confusion, the shame 
and the dread that these lectures are likely to produce in this poor little boy. If you put a phrase like raising my son to be a feminist or speaking to my son about catcalling, you'll find an abundance, a plethora of online articles written mostly by mothers for mothers with uh, various titles all about taming the demon masculinity in their sons. They have titles like How to Raise a Feminist by Reva Seth, How to Raise a Feminist Son by Claire Kane Miller, How I'm Raising My Sons as Feminist by Alexis Barrett Cutler, and quote, 10 Ideas for Raising a Feminist Son by Tabby Biddle, to name just a few. Often the Hatred of maleness in these articles is unmistakable. In a 2018 article called Me Too, Will My Son Grow Up to Be a Rapist? The writer Louise Leontiades finds many causes for concern in the behavior of her five-year-old boy, who unlike his clearly much superior and easier to love seven-year-old sister, seems to have trouble admitting that he's wrong and seems more interested in roughhousing than in emulating his intellectually curious and verbally gifted female sibling. And the mother tells us with narcissistic foreboding that, quote, if predatory behavior is as ubiquitous among men as it appears and as I have experienced it to be, statistically, it is likely that my son will violate someone at some point in his lifetime." End quote. Wow. That grim expectation shadows everything that this little lad does or fails to do in a family home that seems to be full of moral tests totally beyond his years. Another feminist mom named Polly Dunning in an article called Having a Son Went from Being a Dilemma to Being the Most Valuable Lesson of My Life is less fatalistic than Leontiades, but no less doctrinaire in explaining to us how she is going to instruct and mold her son until she has made him into a living refutation of centuries of alleged white male privilege. Originally, we're told she was horrified to discover that she was pregnant with a boy. But having given birth to him, she's pleased at the opportunity to make him into a paragon of feminist virtue. She says, quote, I will raise a feminist boy, just like his father and grandfathers before him, but even better. I will point out sexism to him at every turn and he will never get away with it without being called out." End quote. These seem to be sort of the twin poles in this kind of discussion. On the one hand, a, a sort of fatalistic surrender to the inevitability of one's son becoming a sexual abuser, and on the other hand, a faith-filled determination to produce a model feminist boy. Fairly typical is an article called Talking to My Son About Street Harassment in Bloomberg City Lab by Sarah Goodyear, in which a mother of a 13-year-old boy tells us how she instructs her son about his male responsibilities, which include carrying the burden of awareness, if not of shame, about the bad deeds done supposedly by his sex or the other, and accepting his duty never to enact any of the whole variety of abusive and harassing behaviors that his mother outlines. Beginning from the premise that street harassment is a problem experienced by every young woman on a regular, if not daily, basis, the mother tells us that she, quote, tries to explain to her 13-year-old exactly what it is that the girls he knows are facing out there and how important it is for him never to become part of that problem." End quote. The mother's lurid descriptions of the, quote, disgusting comments that girls allegedly receive make it clear that she doesn't believe the problem can ever be overstated 
She quotes anti-harassment activists, in other words, feminist theorists, who say that, quote, disrespect and lack of consent are the common themes of this abusive continuum, which includes everything from insisting that a girl smile on command to groping her when she's standing next to you on the train and worse, end quote. The mother in this article is so intent on driving home to her son the seriousness of the behavior for girls that she doesn't seem to give a moment's reflection to the effect of her harsh depiction on a pre-adolescent boy. She tells us at one point that she trusts her son, but then makes clear that she also doesn't. She says, quote, my kid is a gentle soul and a generally decent young man. I trust his instincts and his heart, but that doesn't mean I don't feel the need to be quite direct and explicit about his responsibility to be a young man who always treats girls and women with respect on the street and everywhere else, end quote. The mother's desire to believe in her son's decency seems to clash with her feminist informed dislike and suspicion of his masculinity. While exhorting him about his responsibilities, this mother seems never to have warned her son about girls that he should avoid, about girls who make up false stories, about girls who use their sexual power to instigate fights between boys. In fact, it's clear in all of these articles that it's boys who are the problem. It's girls who are the precious resource that should be protected and cherished. A standard feminist talking point is presented, for example, in an essay by Tanith Carey, which is called How to Raise Feminist Boys. She tells us that, quote, it's not boys who are the problem, it's the way they have been raised in a traditionally male-dominated society to believe that a penis confers privilege, end quote. Well, what a relief to be told that as a young boy. You're not the problem. It's having a penis that's the problem. Parents in these articles seem to worry endlessly about what may happen to their girls, how their girls can be hurt, but they rarely say anything about the dangers faced by boys or the psychological and emotional minefield of being told as a boy that there is essentially nothing good about masculinity unless it exists in the service of feminism. Even simply seeing the titles of these many articles would surely have a negative impact on boys' sense of themselves as worthy. Mothers in these articles seem to believe it their full right to lecture and exhort, to shout and cry. In an essay called A Feminist Guide to Raising Boys, feminist B.B. Van Der Zee tells with a certain zest how one night arguing with her teenage sons and her husband about the Me Too movement, at the dinner table, she, quote, lost it and walked away in tears. And then she goes on to say, quote, but you know what? I don't regret it. Sometimes an argument should be that emotional, end quote. So here's a mother who has given herself permission to rant and cry to her sons about her ideology, in effect, tyrannizing over them with the help of her bully tears. She doesn't see this as psychological abuse because she's so convinced of her own righteousness. And there's usually very little in these articles about the boys' fathers, whether they are present in their sons' lives, whether they counter the mother's guilt tripping with a male positive message. And unfortunately, there's no guarantee that even a present father will be able to counter the guilt tripping. Uh, like the father in the Google commercial that some of you may be familiar with, who uses a fancy electronic device to instruct his son about rape on his son's prom night. There are articles with titles like Five Ways for Dads to Teach Their Sons to Respect Women by John Beatty, or Teaching Boys to Respect Women by Justice Col Justin Colson, or Teaching Our Sons to Respect Women by Wayne Parker. These articles push the standard assumption that only boys are ever 
exploitative, or abusive. In the latter article, a father relates horrifyingly to me how his father beat him with a coat hanger for making a snide remark to his mother. Too many fathers, browbeaten and shamed for decades, seem to have no idea how to support their sons. And support our sons, we must, because what is being described in these articles and many more that I don't have time to discuss, is nothing less, in my opinion, than a form of extreme emotional and psychological abuse. I'm not a psychologist, obviously, but I strongly suspect that being told that one's sexuality is disordered, being told that by one's mother, being told that it must be continually monitored and guarded against, that is devastating. We have to speak out against this kind of anti-male indoctrination whenever we can, and thankfully, some parents are. My good friend, Pat Kambampati, remembers the hateful feminism that he encountered when he was a young man at university in the 1980s, and he has vowed that his sons will never have to face it alone. In his words, I am done saying my sons do not matter. And one day soon, I hope we will see Pat's loving anger given expression in manifold ways in school programs and workshops and mainstream articles and parents' organizations and statements by health professionals and politicians and teachers demanding equal care for boys and an end to anti-male discrimination and demonization. I envision a multi-nation march under the banner, not in my name, parents and families against anti-male bigotry. This would be a big tent grouping of non-feminists who reject the denigration of boys. We need to figure out ways to inspire a generation of parents and community leaders to support and defend boys in ways that boys haven't been supported and defended until now. It's atrocious, frankly, that we've been silent for so long. Thank you.